in their air conditioning this week? Raise your hand. Yes, all right. Uh, summer is here, I guess not officially, but um, in, God, in God's time, it, it's happening. Uh, nature and the Lord has brought summer on. Um, so it's good to see everyone braving the heat. Um, I appreciate you all that didn't go to the shore this weekend. Um, it's good to see everyone in the house of God. I'm excited um, for God to show up in some way. Um, I come here because I'm looking uh, to encounter God, to experience God. I like you all, fair enough, but uh, I'm here because I'm trying to uh, feel God with you. So I hope you do the same today. I hope you look uh, in your heart, in your mind, uh, for just an encounter with the Lord. Um, God wants to say something specific to you. Uh, I don't know what you've been thinking about or feeling throughout the week, um, but God has a message for that. Um, so let's center ourselves on the Holy Spirit in this place. Uh, the Bible says, when two or three are gathered, then I am here and I am in their midst. Uh, so as I light this candle, uh, we know that the Holy Spirit never leaves us, it's always around us, but I want us to remember that, that it's not just who we can see today in the sanctuary, uh, the Most High God, the, the Holy of Holies, uh, the Holy Spirit is also in our midst. So let's, let's focus on that uh, just for a second as I light this candle. Let's pray. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We thank you, God. We need you, Jesus, to walk with us as we deal with pain and grief in the news in our own families. Lord, we just ask that you would be near, God. Today, God, as we go about worship, God, speak a word. Lord God, speak to our hearts. Help us uh, rejoice in you today, God. Help us to feel your plan, your, your hope, your desire for us. Help us to know that your kingdom um, is here and coming. Lord, we give it all to you. Whatever is on our hearts and on our minds, God, help us to surrender today. Help us to lay it before the cross. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Won't you uh, rise with me as we sing? Nope, sorry, we're going to do the scripture first. Um, turn uh, to page 1721. We're doing a few Bibles. Uh, it's going to be Acts chapter 16, 9 to 15. Paul's vision of the man from Macedonia. During the night, Paul had a vision of a man of Macedonia standing and begging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul had seen the vision, we got ready at once to leave for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. From Troas, we put out to sea and sailed straight for Semithrace, and the next day on to Neapolis. From there we traveled to Philippi, a Roman colony and the leading city of that district of Macedonia, and we stayed there several days. On the Sabbath, we went outside the city gate to the river where we expected to find a place of prayer. We sat down and began to speak to the woman who had gathered there. One of those listening was a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who was a worshiper of God. The Lord opened her heart to respond to Paul's message. When she and the members of her household were baptized, she invited us to her home. 
If you consider me a believer in the Lord, she said, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. These are the words of our God. Amen. 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 If you consider me a believer, please stay in my house. And she persuaded us. It's a good word. Um, I want you to um, feel free to stand now for worship. Um, it's going to be a, kind of a time of worship. We're trying in the service to do less up and down, up and down. Um, and so we're going to kind of enter into uh, a time of worship. Um, it's going to be two songs back to back. Going to see how we like it. Um, but try, because it's two songs, try to, try to enter into the presence of God. Try to, you know, it might take you first through the first song or the second song, but uh, my prayer is that by, by the second song, you'll forget that you're in the sanctuary, you'll forget about your neighbors, and you'll be feeling really connected to God. Um, if you need to sit down, if two songs standing is too much, feel free to sit down. That's all right, too, and continue to worship uh, seated. Um, but those who are able, won't you rise with me as we sing moment by moment.
light and light that is freely given to us. Join with me now in our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and is sitting at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Sometimes you just need a hug. <laughs> All right. Uh, for announcements. For, for announcements, announcements today, today um, we are having our last Bible study for the summer this Wednesday at 7 o'clock. So if you haven't made out to Bible study yet, here's your chance. Um, it's in the parlor back there. It's been a really good time. You know, it's nice to hear, um, to be in church together. But in Bible study, you can really ask questions, grow deeper, um, just kind of have discussion with each other. So come out to our last one uh, this Wednesday at 7 p.m. in the back parlor. Does anyone else have any announcements? We're thin on announcements. Yes, Bob. Do you have coffee hour? We are going to have coffee hour again. That's a great announcement because I would love for you and anyone to sign up um, to help coffee hour happen again. Um, we're looking for uh, one person. Um, you know, we're looking for you to sign up for one Sunday a month. Uh, hopefully, you and another person. Paired off, and, and those two people uh, will be in charge of coffee hour that Sunday. We have all the materials of coffee. Um, if you want to bake something, that would be nice, or bring in something from ShopRite or something, that would be good too. Uh, so we are looking to start that in June. Uh, so please email Pat uh, if you're able um, to volunteer for that. Good, good, good call, Bob. I've been looking forward to coffee hour too. Um, I know also uh, later on we have a sign up sheet. Um, we're, we're going to be looking for some sign-ups to help support the youth group. Uh, it's, it's coming up. We actually have a video. Um, Andrew, is the video... Is that, a, is that a thing? Yes, sir. So we're going to play a video. I don't know if you want to introduce it, Mike, or just let it roll. Cool. All right, so let's... Hey, what's up, my friend? Mike Nelson. Mike Nelson here. We are having a pizza and game night. Where? Norwood United Methodist Church, 315 Chester Pike, Norwood, Pennsylvania, code 19074. When? It's going to be June 3rd, which is a Friday, 6 p.m. to 10 p.m. When before? It's going to be for students in grades 5 to 12. So look, during this game night, we're going to have Xbox, we're going to have a PS5, we're going to have a main tournament, we're going to have a 2K tournament, and we're going to have a whole bunch of different games for you to be able to come out and be able to enjoy. It's 100% free. Now, we are you? There are only 50 slots available, so what I need you to do is, I need you to register by clicking the link below, go ahead and register because we only have 50 slots, and after that, we're going to be cutting registration. So look, I will see you at the game night. Don't meet me there. Give me there. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so as you can see, we are going to be having a, a game night for uh, youth, and really it's going to be an opportunity uh, not for just, you know, youth there in the church, but more so uh, in the community as well. And so uh, please, uh, you know, anybody in grades 5 to 12, please make sure uh, that you tell them that they can register. Um, it's a form, it's through Eventbrite. Um, if you need the link to register, just uh, go ahead and see yourself or ask your friend at the church. We will go ahead and get you that link. And then also, if you check your email, uh, I'm sure that Pat will send out another email reminder. You can register through there so it's going to be it's going to be a fun time um so we want to be able to uh 
feel this place like it's going to be downstairs where the kitchen area is. It's going to be down there and maybe in a couple of other rooms, just depending on how many uh, students actually come. So please, uh, we're asking that you would register and do it as soon as possible so that we can also have a head count because we will be here to do so. Uh, it would be nice to know. So uh, I had a couple people last week who came, came up to me and said that they were interested in bringing their son, daughter, niece, nephew. So uh, we are excited about the game night. We're excited about what God is going to do. Um, so yeah, so please make sure that uh, you register. And um, please, we need volunteers, as many as possible. Uh, there will be a sign-up sheet uh, somewhere at the service. Uh, I believe it's somewhere. Um, you can volunteer for a couple of different opportunities that we're going to be having, not just for the game night, but the pizza night, but going forward as well. Wonderful. The sign-up sheet will be right here on the altar um, after service. Um, go up. Actually, there'll be one on the altar and one in Mike's hand. I'm going to pass it to him. I forgot to do that. Um, so come see Mike or the altar. Uh, put your name down if you will want to support the youth right now. We need volunteers for June 3rd for the game night. We need volunteers, um, you know, just every uh, every month if you want to sign up for one one youth group night. Uh, right after the, the game night, we're going to start youth group, uh, weekly youth group. So we'd love to have you just pop in. You don't have to prepare anything. Just be there. Support the kids. Uh, try to learn kids' names. Uh, just try to you know, be a, a loving presence of Christ there. And we also need someone uh, to commit to the pizza. Um, you know, I'm sure the kids are always going to be hungry, so if you can commit to that, it's another way to, to give. All right. Is there any more announcements? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I just want to say, uh, before you leave the service, congratulate Hutch. He is 94 years old today. I think that calls for a happy birthday song. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Delaware County Municipal 
Fellowship, which is a retreat for men that we do in November. Um, the initial meetings uh, Tuesday night at 7 p.m. at the Blue Church. Hutch and I will be there. Uh, designed a brochure for it. And if you know any other churches or anyone that you know that might want to join, like a, it's a coalition of uh, Christian men and from churches all over Delaware County. Uh, I'd like to get you involved in that too, but, uh, but uh, <clears throat> it's a great weekend away. It's to get centered in Christ again and be, because it's right around Thanksgiving and it kind of helps me to get in that 50% gray area again for get ready for all the chaos for the holidays and all that. It's, it's just a wonderful weekend and River of Light will be there. If I, if I can rework my schedule or work, I will be there. Um, but um, those are just a couple of things that were uh, on my heart. I just wanted to announce and thank you again for your love and your prayers for Joyce and I. Thanksgiving makes me hungry already. <laughs> We'll definitely keep holding Sue in our prayers. Amen. Anybody else? All right. Um, I'm also going to pray for the community in Buffalo after the um, horrible uh, event that happened there um, and for us here too. All right. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we come with you with both mourning and rejoicing. It always feels these days that we kind of have to hold both at the same time, Lord. Um, help us to hold both at the same time. Um, there's so much we want to pray for, God, and I don't even know where to start, Lord. Um, you know, we do celebrate and thank you for um, Hutch, God, for another birthday, God. We just uh, thank you for his presence uh, on this earth and just the way he's poured into our church over the years. Um, pray for many more good years for him. Uh, Lord, we pray for Deborah, uh, who's going through uh, COVID. We pray for her healing, her mental health, God, her strength. Uh, just be with her, Lord. Um, be close, Lord. Help her to feel you uh, so much closer than uh, what than the sickness or, or just the difficulty she's going through. Uh, stand in the gap, God. Bring her healing and strength, Lord. Um, Lord, we thank you for the River of Life as a ministry, and we, we pray that um, you would open doors for them and bring kids to them, God, that want to learn how to fish and that just want to spend time 
uh, with good mentors in their life. Lord, we thank you for Jim and Joyce, and we pray for their health, God. Uh, continue to strengthen them, uh, and thank you that they're well. Um, Lord, we pray for the Delco Men's Fellowship, God. Uh, add to their numbers, and, and just help them uh, grow, in, grow in depth with you, Lord Jesus. Um, Lord, we pray for Buffalo, Lord. Lord, for what happened. Um, we pray for uh, those who were shot, God, um, that you would hold them now uh, in heaven, God, uh, that you would uh, encourage their spirits. Um, just hold them, Lord. Um, Lord, we pray for their families, Lord, grieving, God, uh, uh, over why this happened when, when their loved ones just went, just went for some cereal, just went for some groceries. God, just be with them, Lord Jesus. Give them comfort in this time, God. Speak a word of, of peace to them. Um, Lord, we pray for the entire um, black community in Buffalo, God, um, wondering how to support, wondering if they're next, God. We just pray peace upon them. Pray for the black community in Buffalo, in New York, um, in Delaware County, in, in Pennsylvania, in our nation, Lord. Um, we pray for um, healing and strength for them. Um, Lord, we just ask that um, you would just be with them, walk with them, um, give them healing after this trauma. Uh, pray for the white community, God, uh, in our own midst, uh, in Buffalo too. Um, help us to learn, God, how to, how to um, serve as, as Christians against white supremacy, God, against this sickness that has taken 10 lives. Um, teach us, God, how to, how to be agents of change and love and, and, and step in and do something about this before it claims more lives. We thank you, God, um, just for the Christian family and community in general. We pray that uh, we can come together, God, and, and be your children and, and show support um, everywhere where violence shows up, Lord. We, we show up with love and, and healing. Uh, so help us be your hands and feet in this hard time, Lord. And we pray finally, God, for Jamie King, Lord. We thank you that he's out of the hospital. We pray for his healing, Lord, in, in rehab. Pray for Sue, God, um, who started chemo. We just pray for her strength, Lord. Um, pray that chemo would be um, quick and easy and it would get the cancer quickly and, and she would have strength in her body. Um, Lord, we pray for Bob Gibbs. Thank you for the Sunday school ministry that he does. Um, and we pray for everyone who, who goes to that ministry, God. Help us to continue to grow in your depth. For everything that I have not mentioned, Lord, but is on our hearts and minds right now, I just pray. Uh, I pray it up to you, God. We need your help. We need your presence. Um, we need you to hear us, and we need specifically to know that we are heard. Uh, so we just love you, and we just thank you that you are um, here for us in this time. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. 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 God, from whom all blessings flow, praise Him, all creatures here below, praise Him above ye heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy Just a reminder for everyone, the offering boxes are in the back of the sanctuary next to the doors. If you haven't already given it, you can give it on the way, way out. Uh, to remind you also that our offerings are not just our money. It is also our time, our talents, and our service to each other. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the gifts that you have given us, that we may return them back to you again 
that you may provide whatever it needs to be done with what money we can give. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second scripture reading is from Mark, chapter 5, verses 21 through 42. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue rulers named Jairus came there seeking Jesus. He fell on his feet, he fell at his feet and pleaded earnestly with him, "My little daughter is dying." Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt, her body, felt in her body that she was free from her suffering. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, Who touched my clothes? You see, people crowded against you, his disciples answered, and yet you can ask, Who touched you? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had, who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembled with fear. But he he told him the whole truth. He said to her, Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, some men came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Ignoring what they said, Jesus told the synagogue ruler, Don't be afraid, just believe. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the house of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and wailing loudly. He went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talias kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. May the Lord bless our reading to our hearts. All right. Amen. Bless God for the reading of his word. Uh, Andrew, if you could put up that first slide. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank you guys, all of you, um, who have uh, treated me like family since I've been here. Uh, I'm still trying to remember everybody's name, so if I do say the wrong name, please. It, uh, I'm still trying to remember. Um, I think I, I stay here. I should be good. I don't know. Um, but it's a privilege and an honor to be here. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I am the brand new uh, youth pastor here, uh, Mike Nelson. And so I'll just share with you a teeny bit of my journey because I know that some people are like, well, Mike, we really don't know much about you. Uh, I'm 33 years old. I'm an Aquarius. No, I'm, a, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, I'm 33 years old. I've um, been married to my wife for the past uh, nine years. Um, I attended uh, the University of Valley Forge, which is a Christian college in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. Um, After that, I went off to seminary. I got my master's degree. Um, At the current time, um, besides being a pastor here, um, I get an opportunity to travel uh, the country and speak at uh, all different colleges, middle schools, high schools, doing motivational speaking and really having the uh, heart to be able to help students. Uh, Also, on Sundays after I leave here, I go serve at my other church, which is on uh, 51st in Woodland, Mount Calvary Family Worship Center, um, where I serve there uh, doing various different ministries. So, uh, that is me in a small nutshell. Uh, So today, um, I'm curious to know from you guys, just, you know, how do you handle 
bad news. Uh, so this picture right here, if you can see, well, you can't see all in, but if you, zo if you were to zoom in closely, the band that's on that man's arm uh, is Michael, ne Michael Lindsay Nelson Sr., who is my father. And so I remember I got a call from my, my grandma. My grandma was ecstatic. She said, Mike, you have to be able to get to the hospital. I said, Grandma, what's happening? What's going on? She said, Mike, it looks like your dad is not going to make it. Now, the backstory of that is me and my father had a strange relationship for about, I'm 33, we had a strange relationship for about 25 years. And so we finally had gotten reconciled, got back together, um, and I would go see my dad every single Sunday after church. My dad had a really bad drinking problem, so he ended up in a nursing home. Uh, his brain um, ended up changing and, and being shaped differently. Um, he was very disoriented. I forgot the disease that he had, but basically it was from him drinking. And so I remember every Sunday I would go, I would visit him, um, and my dad looked like, my dad was 59, it looked like he probably aged about 20 years from all of the drinking that he did. So we would go, I would see him, and we would have such a good time. We would take pictures and make videos, and I just made the assumption that, oh, I know my dad is going to be around for the next 20 to 25 years. Like, me and him are going to have a good time. I can't wait. When I get a bigger house, I'm going to move him into, into my house. I can't wait. And so my grandma called me, and she said, Mike, you have to get to the hospital. My dad ended up getting COVID um, in November of 2020. And so it just kept getting worse, kept getting worse, kept getting worse. And so I remember when my grandma said, look, Mike, there's nothing else that we can do. She said, at this point in time, that we're going to ask the doctors if, you know, they could be able to pull the plug because he was having trouble breathing. Uh, my dad was HIV positive. I'm sorry, my dad had HIV, then it turned into full-blown AIDS. He suffered from depression. He had all kinds of issues. And so I remember when I went to the hospital, this was the last time that uh, I ended up seeing him. He had a breathing tube on. It was me and it was uh, my sisters there. And um, I held his hand and I said, uh, said, Dad, I think that this is going to be it, right? And so when the doctors came in, and they told me, they said, Mike, there's nothing else that possibly could be done. Because I was trying. I was trying to do every single thing. I said, do you mean to tell me there's nothing else that can be done? Can we not, can we not do anything else? Like, they said, Mike, even if he was able to come off of life support, his quality of life, he would never be the same person again. Basically, he would have to be confined to 24-hour care. And so my grandma made a tough decision. So I sat there, and I held his hand, as you can see in the picture. And I said, Dad, thank you for being a great dad for these last seven-something years. I know that we always didn't see eye to eye, but the love that you showed me in these last years, thank you so much. And I sat there, and I watched him take his last breath. And the news that I got, it was so disheartening. I said, I can't believe that my dad, he ended up passing away. I can't believe that my dad is no longer here. The person who helped to bring me into this earth is no longer here. And the news that I got, it was very disheartening. But in that moment, as he, as he passed away and the doctors came in and they declared that he was no longer here, I watched my sister fall to her knees and I watched her buckle. And in that moment, I felt as if the Holy Spirit was speaking to me. He said, son, while this is bad news, but this bad news is not going to break you. This bad news that you got, it is going to be a part of your journey. And so when I wake up now, I'm so thankful and say, God, I thank you so much for all that you're doing in my life. I thank you for all the things that you're doing. But God, I thank you that you have given me the ability and the capacity to be able to handle bad news. So I'm curious to know, you don't have to answer this question, but just think about how do you handle bad news? Now, there are going to be some news that you get, it's going to be exactly like this. Uh, people say oftentimes, you know, when we die, I say, look, I, I'm not trying to be funny. It's not a matter of if, <laughs> it's a matter of when. All of us are going to have to check up out of here one of these days. But the question remains is how do you handle news when you get a report that somebody in your family has cancer? How do you handle when you know, somebody that you know says, hey, you know what, somebody in my family ended up doing something to me that was inappropriately. How do we handle the fact that, man, you know what, the world can be a dark, evil, sick place. How do you ha handle the fact that maybe you had a family member who was in the Buffalo shooting? How do we handle bad news? And oftentimes there's two responses, if we can go to the next slide, there's two responses of how it is that you handle bad news. Now here's what I'm not saying. I am not saying that when you hear bad news, I'm not saying that it's gonna shake you. I am not saying that it's going, it's, it's going to get on the inside of you. But we have two options. We can either operate in faith or we can operate in fear. See, I don't believe that there's anything wrong 
with having moments of fear. We are human beings. You are going to have moments when you're fearful. You're going to have moments when you're doubtful. But the key thing is you cannot invite fear into your life. There's a difference between having a moment of fear and now you operate out of a spirit of fear. People who live, who operate from a spirit of fear, they always tend to say things like, man, you know what, man, I'm just so afraid, I'm just, I, I'm just scared. And again, there's a difference between having a moment of fear and you living in fear. Or the other response is, is that we can operate in faith. So I would just say, the two responses, we just should choose one over the other. So as we look into our scripture today, um, I want to look at a particular person in the Bible who got some disheartening news. And I know that you probably can't see it, though, but don't worry about it. Uh, but we did read the scripture. So um, I want to look at somebody who has got some disheartening news, and I want us to be able to see what was actually their response. Now, it's interesting because in this passage, there's two things that are kind of happening, right? Uh, Jesus had just got done preaching and teaching. Jesus had just got doing amazing things. And so he is on his way. He's just traveling. And as he's traveling through this crowd, um, it says, a large crowd followed and pressed around him. And the woman who was there, I'm sorry, verse 22. Then one of the city God leaders named Jairus came to him uh, and saw Jairus and he fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and she will live. So Jesus went with him. So Jesus is now on his way to be able to heal Jairus' daughter. Now, it's interesting because back in the Bible time specifically, I know that we, uh, we paint Jesus in a great light, but back in the Bible time specifically during this era, the Pharisees and Sadducees and the religious leaders, they did not see Jesus in the same light that we saw him today. So a lot of times they would end up saying little offhand remarks and they wanted to actually kill him. So the fact of the matter is that Jairus... I don't know if you've ever been to this point in your life, but Jairus is so desperate, he's willing to put his reputation on the line because his daughter is dying. Jairus is so desperate, he says, look, I don't care really how this thing looks. I don't care if people are going to talk about me. All I know is, in Mark, the fourth chapter, I saw Jesus. I heard about him calming storms. I, called, I heard about him calming seas. So Jairus is willing to put his reputation on the line and have people look at him a teeny bit different all because he has an issue that he needs to be handled. Point number one, we have to get to a point in our life where we are not, where we are not so prideful that we, we're not so prideful that oftentimes we let our faith get in the way. Like a lot of times our faith gets, our pride gets in the way of our faith. So a lot of times what ends up happening, we say, well, I mean, I should say something, but I'm not gonna say anything. Like I will take this issue to this person, but you know what, I mean, if I tell them, how would they dare to look at me then? I don't know about y'all, but I just got to a point in my life where I believe that, you know, you being transparent and you being vulnerable, it's, it's something that can be able to open up the door. I was so blessed we were having a meeting, uh, me, Pastor Brendan, and Pat, and so we opened up. It was my first meeting, and we all, you know, we kind of went around and shared. So, you know, I'm a new guy. So I kind of sat back and I watched, and I was like, let me see what everybody else has to say first before I start sharing. So... Pat begins to open up and she starts just to, in a good way, she starts to just share the issues that are on her heart. And I, and I was so blessed and I said, this is a lot of times what you don't see. People who are willing to say, look, I might be in a position of leadership or you may see me a certain way, but I have some issues and I have some challenges and I'm willing to be open, I'm willing to be transparent. So what Jairus actually does is, he does something that not a lot of people do. Jairus says, listen, I don't even know if Jairus believes in who Christ is yet because he had yet to reveal himself. So Jairus may not even believe that uh, Christ is fully God, but what he does know from hearing and from different accounts is that he's a healer. So he says, hmm, I don't know what's really going on, but all I know is I need some healing for my daughter. So let me reach out to the person that I heard about. Let me take my issue to this person that I heard about. And who cares if the other people in the church, if they look at me funny, all I know is, is that there's a particular issue that my daughter is having and I need for her to go ahead and get healed. Now, verses 25 through verses 33, right? Uh, 34. This is the story of the woman with the issue of blood that we won't touch on, right? But Jesus go through and Jesus actually heals this woman with the issue of blood, right? So verse 35, it says, while Jesus was still speaking, uh, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and tell him, this heartening news. They tell him, Jairus, your daughter is dead. They said, why bother the teacher 
anymore. Now, if I'm Jairus, I, again, when I, think of, when I think through the Bible, I like to think about it from a psychological aspect. Now, look, verse 22, Jesus, you agreed that you were going to come and you were going to be able to heal my daughter. We were walking on the path, and I, I'm not trying to be funny, but all of a sudden there's this woman who comes crawling, and there's this woman who comes and lays her issue at his feet. Now, if I'm Jairus and I'm watching this woman get healed, I'm sitting there, y'all, and I'm frustrated. I'm like, I don't understand how this is supposed to happen. I told you that we are in a time crunch. Like, I don't have a whole bunch of time, so yes, Christ, I appreciate you, Jesus, for going on ahead and taking care of this woman, but all I know is that you agreed to be able to come with me so my daughter can get healed, but yet and for all, it seems as if he has taken his sweet time. Oftentimes, it seems like Christ is not in a rush. Now, we might be in a rush. I'm in a rush, y'all. You can ask my wife. I'm the most probably impatient person you'll probably meet on this earth. Y'all pray for me. God is still working on me. But at the end of the day, if I'm Jairus, I am frustrated because I'm saying to myself, have I not served Jairus as a synagogue leader? Have I not served the church? <laughs> have I not done all the things that people have asked me to do? Have I not done all that? So this begs the question, family, that you can be faithful and still be frustrated. You can be faithful and still be frustrated. I'm coming to church. I'm doing every, I'm coming to Bible study. I'm doing every single thing. But yet for all, I asked you, God, if you could do this thing. And it seems as if God, I don't know if he's in heaven. It seems like he's twirling his fingers and saying, yeah, I'll take care of it. But I'm not going to take care of it on your time. I'll take care of it on my time when I see fit. So Jairus is probably in, in his mind. He starts off, as I'm sure, he's probably nervous, like, okay, my daughter is dying. What's going to happen? And then Jesus comes along and says, come on, let's go. And by the time he gets to verse 35, now he's like, wait a minute. Now, Christ, I'm not trying to be funny, but if I knew that you was going to take this long, or if I knew that you was going to stop and heal this woman, conversation with her, I could have just left you and went to her, and maybe something different could have happened. It could have been a different outcome. Verse, 30, uh, verse 35, it says, your daughter is now dead. They said, why bother the teacher anymore? In other words, they were saying, this thing is over. This, this thing is dead. It's no reason for you to even bother him. As a matter of fact, if I could be honest, you guys just wasted the trip because she's now dead. And Jairus, I can imagine the city to saying, what am I going to do now? See, we have to get to a point in our lives. It's, faith is not oftentimes about a feeling. Faith is based off of what it is that you actually know. So it begs the question, can you trust God sometimes when you can't trace him? Can you trust him? When it seems like we know that God is all there, but sometimes he doesn't feel as near as in past years or in past months. So Jairus is probably there saying, what on earth am I going to do now? And I love the response of Jesus. Uh, Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, he gives him, uh, he gives him some simple instructions. He gives him two commands. He says, don't be afraid, just believe. Now, he says this to Jairus because, look, Jairus can't even get back into the uh, text at this point because Jairus is probably out of his mind. And Jesus, as he always does, he comes on the scene and he says, look, relax. I got this. Now, it's one thing to say relax. If it's something minor going on, but my little daughter, they said that she's dead now, and you're telling me, uh, don't be afraid, just believe. And again, sometimes we operate out of a spirit of fear, but I know that the word says that God did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. So, I'm not, I don't even think that he was mad, that he was fearful, but it's the point of, what do you do with your fear? Do you let your fear paralyze you? Or do you allow your fear and your faith to push you to say, this is the thing that's going to bring me closer to God? So when I watched my dad take his last breath, I said, nope. I started to think about in my mind, oh, my God, what's going to happen? I thought that we just was going to have the next 25 to 30 years. I'm thinking, God, you, you took my earthly father. What am I going to do now? And I said, stop. Holy Spirit said, stop. I got you. He said, listen, didn't you pray for him to, to be healed? I said, Absolutely. He said, well, he is, he is healed because the back story of that is my dad ended up getting saved while he, was in, while he was in a nursing home. I actually led my dad to salvation while he was, in a, he was in a nursing home. So he said, son, the thing that you prayed for, it did happen because we know that when you get to heaven, there's going to be no sickness, there's going to be no disease. So although he may have not gotten healing on this side, 
he's healed in eternity. So he said, I did answer your prayer, but I just didn't answer it in the way that you thought that it should be. Oftentimes that that happens, we're praying, we're, we're believing God by faith. God, if you could just do X, Y, Z, God, it, it, it would be so great. And let's be honest, y'all, sometimes we do what? We oftentimes, we lie. And what lie do we say? Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul. Until God says, okay, that's great, but the thing that you've been praying for, the thing that you've been hoping for, it's not necessarily going to come in the package in the way that you actually thought it was. But we thought, all right, Jesus said that he's coming, he's going to heal my daughter. And all of a sudden, they have to go through this large crowd, and Jairus is like, what in the world is happening? So he says, don't be afraid, just believe. Have you ever had to believe God out of a difficult and challenging place? Like what you were seeing, it didn't even make sense, but yet and for all, God was still telling you, if you could just hold on, if you can just believe, I promise you that there's, there's a hope in the future, that there's some light at the end of the tunnel, but what we cannot do is we cannot afford to quit. We cannot afford to say, you know what, God, I thought my hands, it's just too hard. Why? Because we have stories in the Bible like this, when you choose to believe. So I, I don't know about you guys, but I just got to a point in my life where I just believe. Now, I'm going to believe until God tells me no. <laughs> until I'm going to pray, until God says, look, Mike, for whatever reason, that's just not going to happen. But I'm still going to choose to believe and operate from a place of faith. Because, if, again, you can't have faith and fear. You can't have it at the same time. You have to be able to choose a side. Now, again, I am not saying that you won't have moments, little moments where you're fearful. But overall, let your faith be the thing that overtakes you. So he says, verse 37, watch this. He said, he did not let anyone except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James, uh, when they came in the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion with people crying and, and wailing loudly. Now, here's what's interesting. I don't know if you guys know this, but what ended up happening uh, during biblical times, they would actually pay professional people to like mourn. So there, somebody would die. And the body is not like we had it today where, you know, the bodies, they decompose way quicker. There was no all this embalming and all, all those things going on. So what ends up happening, they already end up hiring people to come and wail. So when Jesus probably arrives, Jairus is probably thinking, okay, because sometimes you know when you hear bad news and you're such in a state of shock that you don't believe it, you like, it can't, it can't be real. It can't be. Real. God will not allow this to happen. Now, Jairus' worst fear is now confirmed when he arrives because he's looking and he sees the mourners are there and they're crying and they're wailing loudly. So Jairus is probably saying, what in the world happened? Now, verse 39, he says, he went and he said to them, why all this commotion and waiting? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. He said, look, again, this is the part I got, I got, to, work, I got to work on my patience. I don't even know why you guys are getting in such a big fuss and a commotion. You guys are about to plan a funeral. You guys are about to give up. And don't you realize who's here in your presence and in your midst? I, I, I am the one who can be able to bring her back to life. Did you not read all of the stories about me? I'm the one who has the power over life and death. So he says, look, I don't want you guys to be uh, uh, afraid or worry. The child is not dead but asleep. Jesus was kind of poking fun, but he knows that in their minds, she was dead. But in his mind, he says, I have the power to be able to raise her up. But they laughed at him. This is critical. There were people there who ended up laughing and saying, just come on, you can't. Think about it, y'all. If you're there with your loved one, and they just pass away and trade and somebody come, and, and Christ was to come along and say, all right, so I don't want you to be afraid. But I'm like, hold on, but the doctor did declare them dead. We already, we're in the middle of the stages of planning the funeral, and you mean to tell me that we should, like, we still need to believe? Absolutely. And watch this. It says, and he put them out. He took the children's father and mother and disciples who were there and went in where the child was. Now, here's what's interesting. There were bunch of people, right? There were friends, I'm sure. There were family members, I'm there, that were sure. There were all kinds of people who were there, but Jesus had to go in and he'd be able to put them out, and he only took the child's father, mother, and father, and his two disciples in with the child. Why? Because he knows you guys who don't believe, you're about to mess up what I'm trying to do. 
It's so important to make sure that you are around, point three, that you are make sure that you are around people who are oftentimes faithful. People who have the same faith as you. People who have the same belief as you. So many times we are, we are around people and we wonder why sometimes there are lives just seem to go off, off helter skelter. Why? Because a lot of times we're not around people of faith. And I don't know about you, but I just want to be around some people who are faith, like all faith. So Jesus says, look, you guys actually have to get out because I don't need any of that negative energy. You guys laughed earlier. I don't need any of that. So I'm going to politely kick you guys out so I can go ahead and do what I need to do because you're, you are about to be able to mess this up. Isn't it interesting? Jesus oftentimes will travel with his 12 disciples, but yet in the text, he only took a couple. He, he, only, he only took a couple. He said, look, although I travel with 12, there's three that are in my inner circle. There's only a few who I actually trust that have this level of faith. I dare to ask you the question, where is your faith at today? Is our faith more in our problems or is our faith more in, in the God that we actually serve? So he says to her, um, he put them out, took his child, the child's father, mother, and father's disciples who were there, and went in where the child was. And he said, he took her by the hand and said to her, Talithia kum, which means little girl, I say to you, get up. Now, and I'm Jairus, I'm like, what in the world is, I'm like, I'm down with, I'm down with believing, but I'm like, I'm like, God, just don't, just don't make this be something that's going to break my heart. Like, I don't want you to come on, and we pray this prayer, and nothing happens, right? So he says to her, little girl, I say to you, get up. It's interesting to note that this phrase is often like a parent when you are having your child, and you know, when your child was young, and you were trying to get them up for school. In other words, what Christ was saying what I'm about to do and what I'm doing is so easy. I'm just simply bringing her back, back from sleep. Little girl, I say to you, get up. It wasn't something that was like, oh, my God, he had to pray this long prayer. He simply walked in and said to her, little girl, get up. And it says immediately the girl stood up and began to walk around when she was 12 years old. Now, here's what's interesting. Again, I'm talking about the little girl's perspective. She was 12 years old. So watch this. Can you imagine how this little teeny girl felt? I'm 12 years old. Back in the Bible, a Jewish custom, uh, a girl became a woman at the age of 12. So that's what she's probably thinking. While she's laying on the bed sick, I'm not going to be able to, I'm not going to be able to go get married. I'm not probably going to be able to go have kids. And they're probably, her and Jairus are probably thinking through all these things. But yet and for all, Jesus comes on the scene and he tells them to have faith. Last point. Your faith needs to be so strong that you can believe on other people's behalf even when they can. This little girl was 12 years old. I, I'm not sure if she was, you know, uh, spiritually inclined. All I know is that her mother and father, clearly her father believed for her. This is how strong faith is, and this is how strong fear is. It's almost those things where it rubs off on you. So if you're around people like who are faith and like-minded, it ends up rubbing off on you. But if you're around people who are doubtful and fearful all the time, guess what? If you're around five people who are doubtful and fearful, you'll probably end up being a sixth person. But yet and for all, we see in the beginning of the story, it kind of has this ebb and flow where high, high, uh, Jairus is high, then Jairus is like, cool, let's go. Um, let's go ahead and be able to take care of this. But then Jesus stops, and then after that, they come back, and he's like, okay, Jesus, you heal her, let's go. But yet, and for all, I get this very hard, troubling news. So the question I got for you, Norwood, is how do you handle bad news? How we handle bad news is critical. I want this because, listen, I'm not trying to wish nothing bad on you, but I promise you, if you live long enough, and I'm sure that everybody here can attest, at some point in time, you're going to hear some disheartening news. You're going to hear some terrible news. And I just want your response to be a faith response. My grandma, is, my grandma will be 90 in July. My grandma has been diagnosed with pancreatic cancer for the past 12 years. I've never seen, I've never seen my grandma cry. I've never seen my grandma complain. Every time I talk to my grandma, as a matter of fact, when I call and check on her, I leave encouraged. She's like, how are you? I'm like, grandma, I'm, I'm fine. I'm perfectly fine. How are you? She says, I'm just taking it one day at a time. I'm still holding on, and I'm still believing. I said, grandma, it's been 12 years. I done watched my grandma go through chemo after chemo after chemo. My grandma was a little bit on the heavier side. My grandma today is like 112 pounds. 
And guess what? She says, I'm still holding on. I'm still choosing to trust. I, I, I know that this sickness that I have, I know for a fact that it's not probably going to go away. We've been praying, hoping, and believing, but yet my faith is still strong. She said, Mike, I can operate in faith and I can operate in fear, but what I cannot do is I can't operate in both. Now, I'm not saying, she said, I'm not saying that there's not times where I cry, where, you know, I might panic, but at the same time, my faith is built on a strong foundation, and that's Christ. Lord, thank you so much as we pray, Lord. Thank you so much, Father, um, that you have given us with the ability to be able to handle bad news, Father. I pray that when we leave this place, Father, and the next set of bad news that we hear, it will not be able to penetrate our hearts and souls, Father. Lord, there are some people who have gotten bad news 15, 20 years ago, and unfortunately, Father, they have never been able to recover. So, Father, we ask, Lord, that you would be with them, Lord, that you would move in them and through them. But ultimately, Father, we pray that when we get bad news, Father, we can choose faith and we will not choose fear. That we will choose you and we will not choose our fear, Father. Help us, Lord, to be able to change our perspective, Father, of when we get bad news, Father. Help us, Lord, to know that ultimately that you are a good Father. That's who you are. Thank you, Lord, that you still have a plan and a purpose for us, Father. Even wherever stage in life that we are, that you're still moving in us and through us, Lord. So thank you, Lord, for the privilege and the honor that you have given us to be here today. And Lord, we pray and hope and believe by faith that you're going to continue to carry us, Father. I'm not saying our life is always going to be easy, Father. I, Lord, I'm not even saying that we know what the future holds. But thanks be to God, we know who holds our future, and that's you. And Lord, we believe by faith that we're going to continue to pray by faith. We're going to continue to pray for healing. We're going to continue to pray all the things that we need to pray, Father. But ultimately, Lord, help us, Lord, to say yes to your will, Father, whatever that is. And help us to say we are okay with whatever the outcomes is, Lord. Help us, Lord, to get our hands off of the outcomes. You are in control of the outcomes. Our job is just to operate in faith. Lord, and we ask all these things. It's in Christ's name. Amen and amen. You can come down. That's the brain.
amen and amen. Lord, thank you so much. As the hymn said, Lord, the storm is passing by. And so, Father, we thank you so much, Father, that you are in control over all of the storms that are in our life. Lord, we pray that this week um, allow us to be blessed, but most importantly, help us to go out and be a blessing to other people. Help us to go out and share the gospel, the good news, Father, of Christ with somebody else, Father. Lord, I ask that you would keep us safe from any hurt, harm, or danger this week, Father. Help us to go in strength. Help us to go in peace. Help us to go in wisdom, Father. Lord, and we ask all these things. It's in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Go give somebody a high five before you leave. I know it's a, little, a teeny bit hot, so maybe you just want to give them a high five, but please go in the strength of the Lord. Amen. Five, right? <laughs>